We've all heard tales of the conquistadors sailing for the new world in pursuit of riches. These adventurous and ambitious explorers managed to expand the control of Spain and Portugal, bringing great empires to their knees and earning the status of legendary soldiers. But in the exploration and subsequent conquest of the Americas, another key role was played by the women that accompanied said conquistadors. These women, either being single or married, sailed in search of adventure and distinguished themselves in a world dominated by men, becoming settlers, businesswomen, explorers, soldiers, and even governors in the process. A small group of women even achieved the same legendary status that some of their male counterparts had, thus becoming conquistadoras themselves. It is their part in some of the key events during this period that we're going to discuss today. Your continued support allows us to expand our work, and we are so grateful for that. We are always eager to create more videos for you, and we think that you will enjoy our documentaries on post-World War II history over on the Cold War channel, and our Wizards and Warriors channel that focuses on the fantasy and sci-fi lore battle documentaries. Links to both are in the description and pinned comment. Thanks for being with us. Despite the common belief that the Conquistador was a ruthless plunderer that came to the New World to amass a great wealth before returning back to Europe, this was hardly the case, as most Spanish and Portuguese Conquistadors had the objective of colonizing and populating the land that they conquered. This wrong belief is why the Conquistador is attributed to have come alone, instead of accompanied by women. Yet many women also came to the New World either with their husbands or searching for adventure in this new and exciting land. Modern historians estimate that in the period ranging from the years 1560 to 1579, a total of around 5,000 Spanish women emigrated to the Americas, from which 1,980 were married and accompanied their husbands, and 3,020 were single and were probably looking to get married or find sustenance in the new world. One of the first women to travel to the New World was Maria de Toledo, wife of the second viceroy of the Indies, Diego Columbus. She would reach Santo Domingo in 1509, and would later take control of its government in 1515, due to the absence of her husband. During her five-year rule, Maria would fight for the liberty of the natives that had been enslaved during the cruel administration of Nicolás de Ovando, facing a lot of opposition from the local authorities while attempting to change their privileged regime. Not long after, a small group of women would play a key role in the conquest of Mexico, accompanying conquistador Hernán Cortés in his expedition into the Aztec Empire. Their most prominent occupation would be that of a nurse, tending to the soldiers' wounds. But these women would also saddle the horses, take care of weapons, take over guard duties, and even fight in the front lines next to their husbands. Among these women were Beatriz de Palacios, nicknamed La Pada because of her African descent, and considered one of the first black people to ever set foot in the Americas. Juana Mancia, that married one of Cortes's cousins, founded the city of Puebla de Los Angeles and defended it from rival conquistadors. Beatriz González, who arrived with the expedition of Panfilo de Navarrez and served during the siege of Tenochtitlan, and Beatriz Bermudez de Velasco, who heroically stopped a company of retreating Spanish soldiers and urged them to regroup during the siege of Tenochtitlan. The leader of this group of soldier nurses was Isabel Rodriguez, who after the Battle of Atumba established an official nursing corps composed entirely of soldiers' wives and allied native women that would accompany the Spanish men during their expeditions. Isabel's ability to heal wounds was also considered miraculous by many, and such renown earned her the title of Honorary Doctor from the Crown of Spain, a profession that up until now had been restricted only for men. Isabel would then go on to exercise medicine in all the lands of New Spain, making her one of the first registered female doctors in all of history. But probably one of the most important women in the conquest of Mexico would be the fierce Maria de Estrada. Maria had been one of the first women to travel to the New World in 1509, accompanying her brother, the conquistador Francisco de Estrada, in an expedition to the Gulf of Darien. Yet the expedition would soon end in failure, and on the return journey to Santo Domingo, she would shipwreck on the island of Cuba and would end up captured by the natives. For several years she would live among them, until the conquest of Cuba in 1513, 
when she was liberated by a group of conquistadors led by Diego Velázquez. Maria would later marry to one of the conquistadors in the expedition of Cortés, probably arriving in Mexico in April of 1520 to join her husband. During the Night of Sorrows, on which Cortés and his men were driven out of Tenochtitlan, Maria would play a crucial part, valiantly fighting her way out of the city as a true warrior and then participating in the decisive charge of armoured cavalry during the Battle of Atumba. Impressed by her actions, Cortés tried to dissuade her to rest in camp, against which Maria argued, saying, It's not right that Spanish women leave their husbands when they go to war, as where they die, we die, because the Indians need to understand that the Spaniards are so brave that even their women know how to fight. She would then go on to lead a group of conquistadors into the area around Popocatepetl, defeating the Nahua natives of the Huayapan in battle as a true conquistadora. For her role in the conquest, Maria and her husband would be awarded an extensive encomienda in the areas of Tetela del Volcan, Nepopuelco and Huayapan. Looking further south, there are few examples in history of women so distinguished as Doña Inés Suárez, the conquistadora that led the defense of Santiago. Her story begins in 1526, when the 19-year-old Ines married a fellow conquistador that was going to embark for the New World. As the years passed, and Ines heard no news from her husband, she decided to travel to the Americas herself in 1536, arriving in Peru the next year. There she learned of her husband's demise at the Battle of Las Salinas, and was granted an estate in Cusco as compensation. During her stay in Cusco, Ines met with Pedro de Valdivia and allegedly became his lover, joining him for his expedition to Chile. There she would take the role of a nurse, treating the sick and wounded, but also searching for water and supplies. In December of 1540, the expedition arrived in the valley of the Machopo River, where Ines became one of the founders of the capital city of Santiago. Valdivia's expedition would then expand its grasp over the region, capturing seven native chieftains and culminating on September 9th of 1541 with the conquistador himself launching an attack on a native tribe near Cachapoal. The following morning, Ines and Captain Alonso de Monroy found out that the woods in the vicinity of Santiago were full of enemy Mapuches waiting to besiege the capital city. As the enemy prepared, Alonso and the other conquistadors argued whether to release the seven chieftains captured by Valdivia to appease the Mapuche enemies. Yet Inez stepped in and convinced all of them that the chieftains were better off as a bargaining chip in case of attack. On September 11th, instead of waiting for such an attack, Alonso's men came to meet the 20,000 strong Mapuche army under the great warrior Michimalonco but the Spanish soldiers were soundly defeated and soon had to retreat as the enemy native started to shoot fire arrows against the city. Amidst the chaos of the siege, Inez devised a plan to defeat their foe. She ordered to cut the heads of the seven captured chieftains, with the intention of throwing them against the Mapuches to cause panic over their army. Inez herself grabbed a sword and in cold blood decapitated the first of the chieftains, Quilicanta. The conquistadora then headed to the city square and encouraged the Spanish soldiers to counterattack with an inspiring speech worthy of a true captain. Meanwhile, the decapitated heads of the chieftains were dropped over the Mapuche army, leaving them in a state of disorder and confusion just as Inez expected. Thanks to her actions, the Spaniards would win the day and rout the overwhelming Mapuche army, successfully saving the capital city of Santiago. Four years later, Inez would be rewarded with an extensive encomienda for her role in the siege and the conquest of Chile, and in 1549, she would marry Captain Rodrigo Zacaroga, the future royal governor of the new colony. She would then live a quiet life in Santiago until her death in 1580, treated by her contemporaries as a brave woman and as the great captain that defended their city when they needed it the most. Moving to the River Plate region, we find that women also played a crucial role in the expeditions that took place between the years 1535 and 1560. During the first journey of Pedro de Mendoza, a group of women embarked to the New World to colonize the mouth of the River Plate in what is modern-day Argentina and Uruguay. One of these women was Isabel de Guevara, who described how half of the men in the expeditionary force died during famines and conflicts with the natives 
causing the women to take their duties and keep the expedition alive. Isabel would participate in the founding of Buenos Aires and would then travel along the Parana River to also found Asuncion, the capital of Paraguay. Yet women in the New World not only acted as expeditionary leaders or fierce soldiers, they also took positions of power, such as Aldonza de Villalobos, who competently governed the island of Margarita for 30 years, a position she inherited from her father. Another female governor in the New World would be Isabel de Popadilla, who effectively became the ruler of Cuba for five years, while her husband, Hernando de Soto, set out to explore Florida. Finally, Beatriz de la Cueva, wife of conquistador Pedro de Alvarado, would also rule the captaincy general of Guatemala in her husband's absence. Another key role taken by women would be that of innovative businesswomen, such as the cases of Maria Escobar, who was one of the first persons in the New World to bring wheat and to begin its implantation in the Americas, and that of Mencia Ortiz, who in 1549 co-founded a company dedicated to the merchandise traffic with the New World, thus becoming one of the first persons in history to try to exploit the new markets created by the discovery of America. With the conclusion of the early colonization of the New World, women in the Americas started to take a more pronounced role in the construction of a colonial society, but two women in particular would distinguish themselves during this period with impressive feats of leadership and heroism. The first one would be Doña Isabel Barreto, married in Lima to the adelantado Alvaro de Mandena in 1585. Almost ten years later, Alvaro and Isabel would embark on an expedition towards the mythical Solomon Islands, where supposedly lay the legendary country of Ophir and all of its wealth. Despite the long and tiring journey through the Pacific, the expedition would be a success, as Alvaro and Isabel discovered the Marquesas Islands and founded a colony on the Santa Cruz Islands. Yet the Adelantado would soon fall ill with malaria, leaving his wife to inherit all of his titles, including those of Governor of the Solomon Islands and Admiral of the Expedition. Thus Isabel is considered the first female admiral in European history, and she would admirably behave as one. Untamed and authoritarian, Isabel fiercely managed to control her rebellious crew, which was dissatisfied by the poor and inadequate soil of the islands. But the fate of the colony would be decided when the Spaniards murdered one of the local chieftains, earning the ire of the natives and forcing Isabel to abandon the islands towards the Philippines. In the end, Isabel would successfully lead the expedition to the port of Manila, where she would remarry with General Fernando de Castro, a wealthy and prestigious man that could help her prepare a new expedition to the Solomon Islands. Together with her new husband, Isabel would cross the Pacific Ocean, headed to New Spain, and would then travel to her states in Peru, where she would later die, preventing her from accomplishing her dream of a new expedition. The other exemplary woman of this period would be Catalina de Arauso, known to us nowadays as the Lieutenant Nun. Born in San Sebastian, Catalina was taken into a convent at a very young age to be educated in the Catholic values and the duties of being a woman. But the young nun had a rebellious and explosive temperament, and as such she was then transferred to the monastery of St. Bartholomew, where she was treated more harshly and even suffered beatings by the older nuns. Realizing she didn't have a religious vocation, Catalina escaped when she was 15 years old, procuring for herself boys' clothes and cutting her hair to hide her identity while she wandered across the country. For several years she managed to survive doing a variety of jobs, but as many Basques of the era, she soon found herself drawn towards the adventures that laid ahead of her in the Americas. So she travelled to the port of Bonantha, and from there she embarked towards the kingdom of New Granada with her uncle, Captain Esteban Eino. Upon arriving at Punta de Araya in modern-day Venezuela, Catalina and Eino's crew would successfully fight against Dutch corsairs before travelling to Panama. But in the town of Nombre de Dios, Catalina would murder her uncle to steal his wealth and disappear inside the Spanish colony. From there, she would accompany a merchant towards the port of Paita, working as a trader for him across Peru. In Lima, however, she was allegedly discovered between the legs of the merchant's sister, so she was fired and then had to seek employment in the company of Captain Gonzalo Rodriguez, who was going to lead a 1,600-men expedition to fight the Mapuche in Chile. 
Thus, still posing as a man and taking the name Alonso Diaz, Catalina became a conquistadora, proving her worth during the Arauco War and bravely fighting against the native Mapuche, although she would participate in some vicious massacres as well. During the battles of Valdivia and Piren, Catalina also displayed great leadership skills, which earned her a promotion to second lieutenant. But her notorious cruelty against the natives prevented her from climbing through the military ranks, and in the end, this frustrated the lieutenant nun, driving her to seek fights with her comrades and to commit crimes, for which she ended up imprisoned. When Catalina was released, she fled across the Andes Mountains to Tucumán, a very difficult and unforgiving journey which almost caused her death. The lieutenant nun was saved by a Tucumán villager and ended up promising marriage to two young ladies that were unaware that she was a woman herself. Fleeing from there without marrying any of them, Catalina continued to be a troublemaker until she was arrested again in Huamanga in 1623 and sentenced to death. To avoid execution, Catalina begged for mercy to the local bishop and confessed that she was a woman who had been in a convent. After almost 20 years posing as a man, the truth came out when a group of matrons examined her and determined that she was indeed a woman, still a virgin one. The bishop then protected her and sent her back to Spain, where she became a celebrity for her unusual life. She was received by King Philip IV, who maintained her rank of second lieutenant and granted her compensation for her services in the New World. Such was her fame that even the Pope wanted an audience with her. Catalina is an extraordinary figure of the era, being considered one of the first women to change gender. Not only that, but she was probably the first woman to legally become transgender, as King Philip officially allowed her to keep her male name, and in Rome, Pope Urban VIII authorized her to dress as a man. In her autobiography, there are also many examples of sexual encounters with women, such as when she was found in between the legs of the merchant's sister, so she might also have been a lesbian, although Catalina never declared her own sexual orientation. The interesting lives of Maria de Estrada, Inés Suárez, Isabel Barreto, or Catalina de Arauso, among many others, are only a handful of examples about the important role that women played during the age of colonialism, and in the period of colonial Latin America, many more would be fundamental for the construction of an independent colonial society, some of them even becoming leaders of men during the independence wars. The myth about the conquistadors coming alone to ruthlessly plunder the Americas has been disproven for a long time now, yet this myth is still alive in the historical knowledge of many people, undermining the important part that women played during this period, so we're glad we can shed some light over the lives of some of these illustrious female figures, and we expect to hear in the comments which one was your favourite. We always have more stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patron supporters and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.